Let's all, Brother Richmond, welcome. I'm saying welcome. I don't come here, you know, but welcome. He was pastor here at the church. We were, we actually started coming in 1985, 86, something like that. Um, we were in the military. And um, we got into the ministry while we were attending the church here. We started doing a street ministry down on 3rd Street. Um, and then um, he asked us to be the youth pastors, and we thought, really? Us? And um, so that's where it all started. He had faith in us, um, believed that um, God had his hand on us, and I appreciate that. God is so good, isn't he? He's so good. You know... Sometimes we go through hard times, times when um, we have absolutely no control over our circumstances, things that happen. We were recently pulled out of Venezuela, and um, that was probably the hardest thing I've ever that's ever happened in our lives. Um, we lived a lot of awful things during that time, along with a lot of wonderful things, but leaving just broke my heart, unlike anything that has ever broke my heart before. And I couldn't stop weeping for the brokenness. And the Lord showed me one day, I could see myself and his spirit had infilled me and given me strength. But what was so powerful was that the next scene was me inside of him. Him totally engulfing me and me moving and having my strength and everything in him it is in Christ alone that we have strength as the pastor's pastor was telling us this morning it's Christ it's Christ that saves us it's Christ that helps us it's Christ that lifts us up it's Christ in us it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's Christ. Praise the Lord. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all. Here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross where Jesus died, the For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay. Light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth that glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for I am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of Christ not sure you got that 
Then in the ground his body lay, light of the world in darkness slain. Then bursting forth that glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands. introduce to you Pastor Bob. He's going to come and give us the word this morning, and you've met Lisa, and so um, we're so grateful that you were here. Can we give them a warm welcome? It is a joy and a blessing to be here this morning. It's like coming home, except I don't know a lot of the family anymore. It's been a couple of years, and Miss Jackson this morning says, well, Brother Richmond's going to be here. Praise God. I didn't even know he was in town. He's supposed to be in Indiana, Terre Haute, but praise God. It's good to get to see you, and we'll catch up after service. It is a blessing. Mike and Peggy, Morris and Nora, there's just family here, and the rest of you who we don't know. It's a joy to be part of the family of God with you. Amen. And that's what I like about itinerating is we get to go around and meet family. Even though we've never met before, we are God's children. Amen. We are bought by that same blood of Jesus. We are all saved by the same salvation. And it's just good to serve God together, isn't it? And I was thinking, you know, I guess every time I come to Leesville, we came here as GIs, Fort Polk, um, had never been in the state of Louisiana hardly before, and they sent us to Fort Polk, and I wasn't living for God at that time, but God used some, another GI who was actually attending First Assembly at the time to speak to me and encourage me to come to First Assembly in Leesville. And I remember I said, okay, and we walked in, and he went up to the front row. I was like, <laughs> you're nuts. <laughs> and I went and sat on the back somewhere. 
but God touched my life and we started attending the church. We didn't know at that time that two years later we would be the youth pastors of that church. The day I signed out of the army, we jumped in a van and went to Woodworth, Louisiana to summer camp with 30 screaming teenagers. Yeah! <laughs> Always fun with screaming teenagers. And that started our journey in ministry. And over the years, you've blessed us. This church has been a blessing to us. You put up with all of my naivety, my youthfulness, my foolishness. Um, and hey, here we are today. God has used us in, in some pretty amazing ways. Um, we've been missionaries now for 24 years, if you can believe that. We left this church. This church sent us on our way. You know, and, and I'm going to tell you something. Listen up to me. Board members, y'all here? Missions was sparked in my heart because this church always had missionaries come speak. You hearing me? That pastor back there always had missionaries come speak. And I believe your pastor now is going to have missionaries come speak. It was birthed in our hearts because we were exposed to it. Keep exposing these young people to missionaries. Amen. Not because we're great people, but the message needs to continue. Amen. The vision needs to keep getting out there. So this church sent us on our way to Tijuana, Mexico, 24 years ago. We worked there for couple of years we came back at that time you were in a building program this building was being put up and they asked us to pour the footings and the floor and we helped erect the steel and then close it and then God sent us to Venezuela and we were there for 17 years and a lot of those years we lived deep in the Amazon rainforest it took eight hours to get to our house by boat and we worked among Indian tribes and God blessed and used those years and later he took us out and we planted other churches in Venezuela. But he taught us a lot of things in those years in the jungle. It was like school for us. And here just a few years ago, the Assemblies of God, or God laid on my heart to go to Cusco, Peru and do a three-week prayer walk. Never been to Peru before, but we flew to Cusco. We walked up and down the hills and the streets for three weeks and we prayed. And we left, and we thought, okay, that's all good. About a year later, the Assemblies of God approached us and asked Lisa and I if we would be the point people for what they call the Unreached People Group Initiative for all of Latin America. So we began to investigate about the Unreached People Groups of Latin America, and we discovered that Cusco, Peru, is home to the largest Unreached People Group in all of Latin America, the Quechua Indians who speak Cusco Quechua. There's between one and a half and two million of them. Well, recently, because of the violence in Venezuela, because of the, um, the food shortages, the medical shortages, the Assemblies of God pulled all of the missionaries out of Venezuela. Now, I say this, we were some of the last ones out. Most missions agencies began pulling their missionaries years ago. They saw what was coming. There are no missionaries left in Venezuela. The country's too violent. It's too crazy right now. Pray for that country, please. Lift that country up in your prayers. I don't know what God's doing. That country is going through horrific times. We have literally seen through social media some of the people that we pastors lose 100 pounds of weight due to the fact that there is no food. Now, some of them needed to lose 100 pounds. But there is only a certain amount you can lose, and now they're at that point where they don't need to lose anymore. And others that didn't need to lose weight, I don't know what's going on with them. They're not putting pictures on social media. We know people personally who are having serious medical issues in their body because lack of medicine. Just the common everyday stuff that we take for granted. You can't run down and buy acetaminophen. You cannot run down and get your insulin. You can't go to the hospital and get your chemo treatments because there is none. Pray for Venezuela. Amen. Lift that nation up in your prayers because it's not just another nation. Church, these are our brothers and sisters that are going through this. These are Christians who serve the same Jesus that are going through these problems. Remember them in your prayers. Amen? So when the Assemblies of God pulled us out, 
This was in August of last year. It was a time of confusion for us. It was like a roller coaster ride, emotional roller coaster up and down. We've invested 17 years in this country, and all of a sudden they pulled us out. We didn't know what to do. And God just began to take us back to Cusco, Peru, and the largest unreached people group in all of Latin America. And we um, just felt God saying, it's time for you to go to Cusco. So here we go. We're going to Cusco, Peru. And let me tell you, it is a scary situation. Yes, we speak Spanish. We don't have to go learn Spanish again. Uh, yes, we, we're, we know Latin America, and we can go in and communicate, and a lot of the basic things are done. But I want to lay some prayer requests out for you. How many of y'all got a prayer, uh, a prayer card? Does everybody got a prayer card? Raise your hand if you don't. We have some ushers that still have some prayer cards. Could you please get a prayer card to every person? Because that is one of the, our reasons for itinerating and coming. We want you to pray for us. We want you to remember not only the Holloways, but Cusco, Peru, and the work that we're going to be doing. I'm going to give you some prayer requests. Number one. We're moving to Latin America, but we're moving in among the Cusco Quechua, and they speak Quechua. They can speak Spanish as their business language, but it is not their heart language. Their heart language is Quechua. I want to reach their heart. I'm 55 years old, and i got to learn another language. Do you all know how hard that is? <laughs> Some of you all don't. Most of you all don't. We need to learn Quechua. And we've been fighting with Spanish now for about 18 years. And I speak pretty good Spanish. I can get around. But Brother Blanco will tell you it is not perfect Spanish. <laughs> it's okay. I want to speak Quechua good enough that I can reach the hearts of these people. Will y'all lift us up in prayer that God will give us some kind of a gifting that we can learn Quechua so that we can speak their heart language. You know, your heart language, most of you, is English. Brother Blanco, his heart language is Spanish. He can speak English to you, but I'll bet when he goes home and reads his Bible or whatever, he picks out his Spanish Bible, not his English Bible. When I'm preparing for a sermon, even in Latin America, I get out my English Bible. Yes, I can read the Spanish Bible, and I cross-reference and all that, but my heart is in English, so I need to learn their language of, of Quechua. So pray for us about that. Second prayer request, Cusco is at 11,000 feet altitude. We lived in the Amazon rainforest in Venezuela. Now we're going up to 11,000 feet altitude. We need God to give us health in our bodies so that we can live at that altitude because many people cannot. We've never had problems. We've gone there to visit. We've been there for two, three weeks at a time, and we've never had any ill effects of it. But Roy and Rebecca were up there with us uh, this past um, October, and they can tell you it ain't like walking around the streets of Leesville. It's tough. you got to kind of walk slow and mosey a little bit. But um, we need God to touch us. Every Assemblies of God missionary that we know of in the history of missions in Peru the ones that have gone to Cusco within a year had to go back because they could not handle the altitude. I believe God's got a mission, and if we're going to fulfill that mission, we have to live there. So pray that God will guide and direct us and help us and give us health. Third prayer request, Cusco, Peru is the capital of what used to be the Inca Empire. I don't know if you know anything about the history of the Inca Empire. They controlled everything from Colombia, Ecuador, Bolivia, Peru, parts of Chile, parts of Argentina. They control the entire western portion of South America. Cusco was their capital. Machu Picchu was their spiritual capital. If you look at your prayer card, the big picture there is Machu Picchu. On the back side, that's Cusco. On the, on the back is, is the plaza in Cusco. On the front, that's Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu is where there were literally hundreds, if not thousands, of sacrifices of babies that took place to the sun god Inti and to Pachamama, which is Mother Earth. 
I believe that the acts that they did back in hundreds of years ago in the Inca Empire still hold a spirit, have a spiritual stronghold over Latin America today. I honestly believe that with all my heart. I believe that God spoke that to us while we were doing our prayer walk in Cusco. I believe going to Cusco, Peru, we are going to enter into the most intense spiritual warfare that we have ever ex encountered. Now, in the Amazon rainforest, when we lived there, we had witch doctors living on every side of us. We were surrounded by witch doctors, but I still feel like we are going into even more intense spiritual warfare in Cusco, Peru, than we experienced living in the middle of witch doctors in the jungle. We need God to help us. So here's what I want you to do. Take your prayer card and, and turn it up like this. How many of y'all, now look at the picture. How many of y'all can see the face in the mountain? Look at the highest peak in the mountain, and that's the nose. Does anybody see the face yet? Okay, some of y'all see it? Well, that's what the Incas saw when they came across Machu Picchu. They said that is the face of a god, and that's why they chose that site as their spiritual center. Church, Hang your prayer card like that on your refrigerator if you're one of those that puts prayer cards on your refrigerator. And remember Machu Picchu. Remember the spiritual warfare that is going to be encountered in Peru. Amen. Because we believe that God wants to do a work there. Now, the Assembly of God has asked us if we would open up a school and train missionaries who are going to go and reach the unreached people groups. So any missionary in the Assemblies of God who wants to go work among unreached people groups in Latin America is going to come live with us for a year first. So y'all pray for them. That could be torture. But we want to teach them and train them and give them tools so that they can effectively go and do what God's called them to do. I remember when we arrived on the riverbank in Amazonas and we jumped out of the boat and we had a scripture verse and a vision and that was it. Nobody had ever trained us to do anything. And I'm not an expert on nothing, but I can show enough tell you what not to do. And <laughs> I hope I can do a little bit more than that if we get this school opened up. But we want to train missionaries and give them tools. And one of the tools that God has given us is biblical storytelling. Have you all ever heard of biblical storytelling? We call it orality. Some of you all, when you hear biblical storytelling, your mind's going back to Sunday school a long time ago, right? Flannel graph boards. Do you remember the stories? It works, don't it? <laughs> and so we are going to be using biblical storytelling. We are going to be training people in biblical storytelling because it's actually not as easy as it sounds like. And uh, this morning, but here, here's the thing. In Latin America, we have 16 million unreached people. I'm not talking about people who have not accepted Christ. I'm talking about people who have never heard the message of Jesus in a way that they could understand it enough to respond. Reason being, first of all, most of these are indigenous tribal groups. They speak all kinds of different languages. Our 16 million unreached people speak about 320 different languages. Most of our missionaries never get past Spanish. So we try to present Jesus to them in Spanish, and it's not their heart language, so they don't respond. They don't understand the impact of what Jesus has done for them. So we need to train missionaries to speak different languages. These tribal groups live in tough places. When we were in the jungle, we were eight hours from the nearest road. In Cusco, we're going to be dealing with altitude. This past October, we went there, and... They took us around the mountains, and we made a loop around a little corner of this place. And we saw how extreme the conditions can be. Now, we've been told there's 5,000 villages in the state of Cusco. There's the state of Cusco whose capital is the city of Cusco. In the state of Cusco, we've been told there's 5,000 indigenous villages. There are 200 evangelical churches among those 5,000 villages. So that means there's 4,800 villages that do not have a witness of Christ, that do not have a pastor, and our challenge is to plant 4,800 churches. 
And I know y'all are looking at me like I'm crazy now. But you know what? God has given us new tools. He's given us new strategies and new ways to do things. And one of them is biblical storytelling. And I'm going to demonstrate that for you this morning. We're going to do a church service this morning, kind of like what we would do in an indigenous village in Peru or in the jungles, wherever it might be at. And you guys are going to participate. All right? We don't want, I don't want y'all just sitting there staring at me. We, I did this Wednesday night down in Des Almonds, and you know who participated? They had the children in there. The kids loved it. The adults stared at me like I was nuts. Don't stare at me like I'm nuts. Come on, get in here with me. We want you to participate. Now, this is intimidating because I've heard Larry Richmond preach. He's one of those throwdown preachers. I'm not. So, we're not going to throw down this morning, but we are going to hear God's word, and y'all are going to participate, and um, the Holy Spirit's going to speak to us this morning. In fact, I believe he's already began, because how many of y'all know what today is? Pentecost Sunday. We're here celebrating Pentecost this morning, and some of us don't even know what that means, and we're in a Pentecostal church. And God has given me a story this morning about Pentecost, and we've been singing about Pentecost and the Spirit coming, so let's continue in that vein this morning, okay? Now listen to this story as if you've never heard it before. You're not a Bible theologian. Listen to it with fresh ears. Forget about the sermons you've heard on these particular particular scriptures that you're going to hear the story come out of, but let the Holy Spirit begin to speak to you this morning, amen? Amen. So I want to tell you a story from the Word of God. Jesus had been taken back up into heaven to be with his Father. But before he left, he told those that were gathered, he said, Go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father, because you're going to be filled with his Spirit so that you can be witnesses to the entire world of what I've done. Now, in Jerusalem at that time, There was a festival celebrating the harvest. It was called the Festival of Pentecost. And when Pentecost Day arrived, many of Jesus' followers were gathered together in a room. And suddenly, there entered into the room where they were sitting a violent wind, and it rushed in, and it filled the entire place. And flames of fire came down and descended and separated and rested on each one of them. And they were filled with the Spirit of God. And they began to speak in unknown languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now, at that time in Jerusalem, there were people gathered from all over the world, devout Jews. And when they heard the confusion, they gathered, a crowd gathered together and they began to say, What is this? We hear them speaking in our languages. How can this be? These are men, aren't these men from Galilee? How is it that we hear them declaring the works of God in our native tongue? And they said, what amazing thing is this? But others, they begin to mock and make fun, and they said, these guys are just drunk on wine. But Peter, one of Jesus' closest followers, he stood up among them. He said, listen to me carefully. In spite of what you think, these guys aren't drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. This is what was promised or foretold by God's messenger, Joel. When God said, I will pour my spirit upon all human flesh. My mind went blank, sorry. (laughs) I will pour my spirit out upon all human flesh. This has never happened to me before. (laughs) No, we're not going there yet. (laughs) And he began to tell them how that God had manifest his power among them through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. And then he, he continued to remind them, he said, you crucified Jesus. But God raised him up again because not even death could hold him in its grip. And this Jesus that you crucified, God has exalted him to his right hand. And having received the promise of the Father, he has poured out what you see and hear today. 
And the people that were gathered there, they were distressed and they said, what do we need to do? And Peter told him, he said, you need to turn from your rebellious ways, turn your heart back to God, and be baptized as an act of obedience that you are going to be his follower. And you too will be filled with the Spirit of God. Because this promise is for you, it's for your children, and it's even for those that aren't even born yet. And many people believe Peter's message, and they turned their hearts to God, and they were baptized, and they were filled with the Spirit of God. And that day, over 3,000 people were added to the number of the church. That's the end of the story. Now comes your part. What do you think about that story? Tell me about something you like about that story. Huh? It's for all people. Anybody else? What do you like about that story? The boldness of Peter. Jesus' followers were gathered together. There was a sense of unity. A promise of something to come. The fire came and divided and set on all of them. Three thousand added to the church. Wow. The Jews understood the different languages they were speaking. Anybody else? Something you liked? Prophecy fulfilled. Even though there were mockers, it didn't stop God from touching people. That it's for today and your children and those that aren't even born yet. It cut to their heart. Yep. Now what do we do? <laughs> Amen. A good Pentecost Sunday verse. <laughs> the Holy Spirit took control of the church. Amen. Anybody else? Come on. I know you three got something. Well, he used the word coincidence, but I don't think, I think God directed that it was a celebration of harvest when he poured out his spirit, because I think church without the spirit of God, we're not going to celebrate harvest. Amen. Anybody else? Come on, all you young people back there. Today we would say a paradigm shift in the church. <laughs> something new, something entering in that had never been seen before. Amen. Are we ready for that? Anybody else? Something you like? I know this is weird for people whenever that we start doing Q&A in service. But this is how we do it. So we're in, we're in an Indian village. Y'all got to play along. Okay, we're going to go to the second question. What do you not like about this story? Something that kind of is a, you have a struggle with, it confuses you. Most people don't like to answer that. They're like, I don't have any problem with the Bible.
people mocking and criticizing because they didn't understand what was going on. Amen. Anybody else? Something you didn't like about this story? Ah, not all of Jesus' followers were there, eh? <laughs> More could have experienced that day. Anybody else? Something you didn't like? It's kind of hard to not like the day of Pentecost story, except for people making fun, people mocking. So I don't think we're going to get much more feedback on that question. So let's go to the third question. What do you see about the nature and character of God in this story? The nature and character of God. I see that he's a promise keeper. He talked through Joel hundreds of years before and said, I'm going to do this. And those guys got to live the fulfillment. How many times do we get tired of waiting? Anybody else? Nature and character of God in this story. His power was demonstrated even in the middle of the weakness of mankind. Everybody understood. Anybody else? I like that too. It was after Matthew 28, 19, going to all the world and preach the gospel that he said, okay, now I'm going to give you some tools to go do it with. I like that. There was somebody else. His, his willingness to forgive and fulfill his promise even though they had messed up. So the denier was there receiving the power and the one that maybe the one that said I'm not going to believe unless I see the nail holes in his hands and feet. Hmm. Wow. So God doesn't wear a Timex. <laughs> so it wasn't just the Spirit on them, it was the Spirit in them. God was purposefully filling them with himself, with something supernatural I believe that is the nature and character of God and I believe he still wants to do that amen anybody else amen there's something about the presence of God that does stuff changes people from mocking to saying what do we got to do <laughs> so no telling how many people were gathered for the celebration of Pentecost of harvest but only 3,000 made the choice to say we'll, we'll believe this message over a million in that day in the city wow 
Yeah, those that were gathered together waiting as Jesus told them to. Mm-hmm. Yep. Declaring his sovereignty. Anybody else? Something about the nature and character of God in this story? Demonstration of a new relationship between God and man. Amen. God does things on his time schedule. Some of y'all just aren't participating here. But we're getting more and more. Come on. All right. I knew they'd get some, get into it eventually. So whether they believe or not, God is going to glorify himself. Amen. To, uh, let's say, a secular bystander who doesn't understand things, the glory of God can be confusing and, um, and it looks like people are under the influence of something anyway. <laughs> it's for the unbeliever. Okay. Nature and character of God, anybody else? Let's go to question four. What do you see about the nature and character of man in this story? Perseverance. Yeah, some theologians say they were there for two weeks. Um, now, we are in June, and Easter was a number of weeks ago. That would be more than two weeks, but we also know that these calendars move around and the dates aren't always the same for Easter. The dates aren't always the same for Pentecost Sunday. So we don't know exactly how long they were there. But if we waited for the presence of God, or do we get antsy? <laughs> he ain't showing up. We're a microwave society. He said to wait. He didn't say how long, so I don't think it's really going to happen. Ooh, how many of them left a day or two before? Missed out. Anybody else? The nature and character of man in the story. So some were, had lack of patience, others were persevering, others had lack of patience. That's true. Those that left early, time ran out for God. Questioning Jesus? Come on. <laughs> Yeah, who does that? I'll raise my hand. <laughs> Some witnessed the power and still did not believe. They saw something weird, something new, something they didn't understand, but this can't be God because my church says, my belief system says,
So she says it's like goes back to the knowledge of the tree of or the tree of life and the knowledge the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil builds up us flesh, and the tree of life builds up God within us. Did I? Okay. That's good. Anything else about what do you see about mankind in this? Somebody said something back here? Now remember, church, we're here today celebrating this act, this event, this piece of history, this day that God chose to inject his same spirit in corrupt human flesh once again. Hadn't happened since the creation story when it says, and God breathed the breath of life into man. Never again do we hear, we hear about the spirit of God coming upon people for acts to accomplish, but now we're talking about the very spirit of God dwelling inside of human flesh. So now we're going to go to the fifth question. And this is the most important of all of the questions. And I want you to bow your heads, close your eyes, because this is where God's going to speak to you. And this question is for you to answer to you. This isn't about what do you see about mankind in general. This is for you. And I want to preface this if Miss Debbie could maybe give us a little bit of piano. God is going to come. He's going to speak to you. I believe it with all my heart. We have altars up here. If you choose to come up here and let him speak to you, if you want to walk, if you want to kneel down where you're at, if you want to stand. But the question is this, what is the Holy Spirit of God saying to you in this moment through this story? So close your eyes and let the Holy Spirit speak to you for a little bit. Holy Spirit, come and speak to us. We've heard your word. It's your word. It's your story, Lord. It's not something I made up and invented. It's your story. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come today and that you would enrich our lives through your story. But also, Lord, we need a confrontation or an encounter with your spirit today. Lord, we're here celebrating the, that event in history when you chose to once again pour out your spirit upon mankind. We need you today, Lord. Speak to us.
You know, it doesn't always take the Holy Spirit a big long time to speak to us, and I believe He's spoken to you. I believe He's spoken to many hearts this morning, those who have ears to listen. So, the fifth question is, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you? And I want to give that opportunity as well, if somebody wants to share as a testimony or ed to edify the body, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you as an individual through this story? If he can do it then, he can do it now. We need that mighty rushing wind, God's breath, to rush into our lives. Amen. God didn't have an age limit on that group that he poured his spirit out on. He gave it to the old and the young alike because he still has something for them to do. And if God can tell an 80-something-year-old woman that there's still something for you to do, he can tell every one of us in this room today. We need that Holy Spirit. We need to be, I, I think Paul would have said in Romans, be controlled by the Spirit, be under the influence of the Spirit, be drunk in the Spirit, however you want to say it. But if we are Spirit-controlled, Spirit-led, that's when the world's going to see Jesus. That's when the world's going to see Jesus. Anybody else? What's the Holy Spirit speaking to you?
What are you going to do? Means he's holding you responsible. Anyone else? Everybody, it's usually harder for some people to share what God's speaking to them because it's almost a time of confession sometimes. <laughs> but God, I know that God's speaking to people here this morning. That blesses my heart, what Ms. Jackson said, what Ms. Harlow said. All of you, what, what, what you've shared blesses me. A fresh and a new infilling. You know what? I, I really believe that this morning God wants to do that for us. And there might be people here that you've been in the church for a hundred years, but it's become stale to you. There's, I like the words that they use in the story in Acts. They were baffled. They were bewildered. Bewildered. They were confused. There were emotional reactions to what was going on. And nowadays. We don't get in awe of God anymore. We've become stagnant. And even as Pentecostals, I'm Pentecostal by name only because my parents raised me in that type of church. But I am not bewildered by my God anymore. How many of y'all believe God wants to pour his spirit out on First Assembly of God in Leesville, Louisiana? He wants to give us a fresh infilling. He wants to be glorified in us and show his power through us. Let's just stand up. This isn't normal. This isn't how we would do it in the Indian village, in the mountains in Peru. But I believe the Holy Spirit, just ask him, say, Lord, fill me anew. Fill me again. Maybe you haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit ever. Maybe you're here this morning and you have never received the infilling of the Spirit of God. If you are in right relationship with Him, if you have believed the message of Jesus, if you have repented of your sins and become a follower of Christ, the Bible says you will receive the Spirit of God. Reach out to Him in faith. I'm not going to go around and lay hands on you necessarily unless God tells me to. You reach out to God and say, Lord, fill me new. I need a new I need something new. I am dried up. I am dead inside. I have taken you for granted. I am stagnant. Let your water flow through me again. Let your spirit flow in me again. Fill me, Lord. There is no love sweeter than 